Are you blessed this morning? Yeah. Amen. Amen. So good. So now uh, I wish I could tell you we're going to give a nice little Christmas message, but we're not. <laughs> we're going to uh, come back for Christmas Eve. That, that's where that is. But I'm going to tell you that uh, God is so good, he puts everything together. I mean, without hardly trying to focus on ourselves and, and put things together, God is just revealed in the simplest of ways. I, I, all sorts of talent within the church. Amen? Isn't that great? So I love the fact that uh, the purity of kids, the innocence of kids coming up, the hard work that's gone in, one of my favorite things is even though there was uh, you know, great fear, didn't run away, stayed. What a blessing. What a blessing. We're actually going to finish up John chapter 3 with our conversation with Nicodemus on just verses 18 through 21. We're going to kind of bounce around in Scripture a little bit. But I want to I start off with this, and we are going to talk about Christmas a little bit. <clears throat> God wanted to throw something different out there today. Uh, so I'm just going along with that. But as you well know, in the last few years, Christmas itself has been under attack a little bit, hasn't it? It's really not Christmas, it's really Jesus that's, uh, that's being attacked and I'm going to throw this out there, and I'm going to emphasize it again later. We don't worship, or we don't come together on Christmas because of trees and lights and presents. We come to worship the King. That's what was sung about this morning by, by all. It was played um, so brilliantly here. It's because of the King. And that's who we're talking about, Jesus Christ conversation with a simple man. Let's look at those verses. I'm going to start in verse 17. It says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is, is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Heavenly Father, as we open up your word this morning, Lord, let us focus on the light on Jesus Christ. There's nothing that darkness can do to blot out God-given light. And we praise you for that this morning. And as we look and see what the, the last message that Jesus has, has won the victory for us and what he has already done, Lord, may it grip our hearts tight this morning. May we hold on to Jesus forevermore. Lord, we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Verse 18, I love this phrase, right? I love this phrase, he who believes in him is not condemned. I don't know about you, but that's a reason to celebrate. Isn't that the great baby that was born on, in, in a manger was the promise. It was the promise of life, the promise of salvation, the promised Savior to come. And here we have later on in his life, if you believe in the promised Savior, you are not condemned. You are not condemned. We do not have the deserved condemnation. Belief in Jesus frees us from deserved condemnation. But if we look at that word, what does that word really mean? Because we use it liberally at, at different times. And it really, it's really talking about to be implicated morally and judiciously. right? Ju judicially. Pronounced guilty and sentenced to death according to the penalty of the law, forever separated from the presence and blessings of God. That's a lot of definition in just one word. All right, let me read it to you again. To be implicated morally and judicially pronounced guilty and sentenced to death according to the penalty of the law. Now, mind you, it has said nothing about you standing trial. 
Think about that. It said nothing about a standing trial. It said everything that we were already found guilty because of our sin. But if we read those words that say, who believes in Jesus Christ is not found guilty. Oh, there's a great reason to rejoice on the earth today. But it is, it is important that we look at that second half of the verse. It says, he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten the Son of God. And it's our unbelief that testifies against us. And pronounces us guilty before the King of Kings, the ultimate judge, Jesus Christ, who has given the authority over everything here on the earth. It's our unbelief that testifies against us. You know, just thinking back before Jesus got a hold of your heart, and maybe you're sitting there right now today, can you remember times that you had of unbelief? That maybe Jesus wasn't who he said he was? Or, as a kid, why do we have to go to church every single Sunday and learn about Jesus? I know who Jesus is. I heard him last Sunday. Right? I know you've had these thoughts as a kid. Just think back. I used to complain to my mother all the time. It did no good. But I felt better. <laughs> Until I learned who Jesus really was later. See, in John chapter 12, verses 46 through, through 48... Jesus, just a couple chapters later, he gives us a little extra insight into what he's talking about here. He says, I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last days. Our Spoken words, our unspoken words of whether we believe in Jesus or not, judges our own actions. Now, I don't know about you, but that's kind of scary to think about, and yet, at the same time, it's also very encouraging. The word says very clearly, if you, if you unbelieve or if you don't believe in Jesus, that unbelief will end up being your judge. However, with a simple act of faith. You are therefore cleansed and purified before the King of Kings and forever with the, the Heavenly Father. That's the encouraging aspect. That is free, a free gift to all. It has already been spoken about this morning. Salvation is found in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Does that excite you this morning? Does that encourage you this morning? Salvation is found in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Just think about that. He doesn't have to be crucified over and over and over and over again because we continue to sin. He already did it once and once was good. Once was perfect. However, there is the truth of people who reject Jesus and his work on the cross reject God's saving light. His answer, life found in Jesus Christ. And the truth is, they are already convicted and condemned if they continue to choose not to believe in God's rescuer. The promised Messiah, the baby, turned into a man who died on a cross and is now full in all of his deity. That's our God. That's the greatness of our God. In John chapter 1, it says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. I think you could say very clearly and safely today, that's pretty true. Darkness does not comprehend the light, or does, does not comprehend the greatness of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8, we can go a little further. He says, I am the light of the world. This is Jesus. I am the light of the world. He who follow me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. That's the promise. That's the promise. We're here on uh, just a few days away from Christmas, celebrating not just a baby in a manger. We are celebrating the promise of light in the world that will forever be. That's our God. And what we have in the next or in that first section, he who believes in, in him is not condemned. People who believe in Christ are pronounced innocent by the blood of Jesus Christ. You ever had a cop knock on your door? Whether you uh, did something wrong or not, it brings fear. 
And it should. And all you want to hear is, you're not the problem. <laughs> right? Now magnify that by a million times, and you're standing before the judge of all eternity, and you hear those sweet words. You're innocent because of the blood of my son. It's fantastic. Romans 8, which we've mentioned many times, says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the promise. No condemnation. Or in John chapter 5, Most assuredly I say to you, He who hears my word and believes in him, believes in Jesus, in the Father who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come in the judgment, but is passed from death into life. That's the promise of that, that baby boy. It's the promise of our Savior. It's the gift of the cross and the empty grave. We have passed from death, the penalty of the law, into life, the gift from the Father. The greatest gift that can ever be opened by any man, woman, or child who will ever take a breath in this world. That is the greatest gift. Now, I want you to... I want you to kind of picture this scene this morning. Standing in the courtroom of God. How does that make you feel? There's only four people present. It's God the Father. There is the plaintiff, Satan himself. You have your defense attorney, which is Jesus, and there is you. We're standing in the courtroom of God. And we stand not only accused, not only charged with the defense, but we already stand guilty in our sin. And here's the, the interesting part is we can't plead not guilty. There is no trial or process that you can take where you can plead not guilty and have a hearing. Your unbelief has already testified against you and convicted you of your guilt. That's the heavenly court. But here's what we can plead. And I'm going to get a little technical with you over the, the next few minutes. But we can plead what is known as in bar. It means we can make a plea that denies the plaintiffs, or in our case, the accusers, right to maintain their lawsuit because of the constitutionally protected right of the defendant. Or, let me get more specific, uh, we can claim this right because of what is written in Romans 8.34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. This is our plea. This is what we can plea. Our God has covered us. There is no defense or no, or no crime that be, uh, can be charged against us. Jesus covered it all. Your case holds no water. You may leave. Isn't that what we want to hear? That is, our, that is the only grounds we have to stand on because our defense attorney already did everything for us. It wasn't that we did anything special. It was that God was everything special. He offered salvation through faith. That is the greatness of our God. Matthew Henry says a little of this. He says he is afflicted. This is uh, talking about people in the world, you and I. He is afflicted, chastened of God, persecuted by the world, but he is not condemned. The cross perhaps lies heavy upon him, but he is saved from the curse. Condemned by the world it may be, but not condemned with the world. That is everything. Right? We may live in the world, but we're not part of the world. Right? We can testify to the world, but we represent the greatness of our God. Why is this important for us? Because the world's judgments are often quick, harsh, they're full of pain, they're full of accusations, they're full of falsities, and has very little understanding. Chances are, if you go anywhere today and talk about Jesus publicly, you're going to find out what that is really like. And here's the goal of it all. It's to make you doubt. Make you doubt. Back to Genesis 3. Make you doubt. Separate you from your fellowship, from the fellowship of believers, from the support system that God has placed you in your life. This is how you are weakened, right? If you have doubts, you generally 
casually pull away from those who are around you while you try to figure it out on your own, and then in the end, you are isolated from wisdom and encouragement that you need to stand victoriously. And when it's all said and done, you, you utter two words, or three words, I should say. I give up. That's the enemy's goal. That is the enemy's goal. That is not what Jesus says for us. That is not what he has to say. Flip over to, keep your finger there, but flip over to Romans chapter 8, because I want to point this out for you. Romans chapter 8 in uh, 35 through 39, just these couple verses. Verses that we really need to think about and celebrate, especially at Christmas time. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the promise of the Savior. Not only do we have God's love, but we have God's protection that is found in those verses. Not only do we have his protection, but we have his guaranteed victory because Jesus has already won the victory. And since he has won the victory, we have security forevermore. Eternal security for your soul. That is a reason why we celebrate every single day. Not just because it's Christmas. It's because of what God has done for us. Every day is like Christmas when we treat it as such. But unbelief. Unbelief leaves us buried under the guilt of our sins. I tell you this because that is what is upon us today in this world, in our society. It should try to get you to believe in something other than the greatness of God. Than the wonderful, wonderful birth, death, and resurrection of our great King, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you flip back with me to, to uh, John chapter 3, we have verse 19, the next verse that comes along. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Men loved darkness rather than light. And we see it. We see it represented all over the place. We see that knowing that Jesus Christ is our light in the light for the entire world. There's only one God, one name that is fought against through the entire world. It's the name of power. It's the name of salvation. It's the name of eternity. It's the name of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, I just want to read this to you. You, you can flip there, I guess. It's only two pages over. Verses 6 through 13. Here's the proclamation of Jesus as our light. Talking about John and then Jesus, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. That's you and I. That's forever. That is all time. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. This is the sad part. This is the darkness that fights against Jesus Christ. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. To be born again. The same conversation that he has with Nicodemus just a little bit later, two chapters later, you must be born again. That is our light. And yet we find it remarkable that he was sent to his own people and his own people rejected him. And it's not just his own people, his own family rejected him. 
His own family did not believe in him until after Hebrews was resurrected. See, light reveals, it enlightens, it proves its power, it brings rejoicing to the heart, to the mind, and the world. I don't know about you, but I cannot wait till the summertime. I like sunshine. Right? And that's just the glory that God has displayed to us in the, in the creation of the world. Sunshine brings energy, it brings life, it brings joy to the heart. Repeated darkness just continues to hold you down in a, in a continual despair. Well, if we magnify that, that is the light of our soul. Jesus Christ. The giant beam that just lights you up from the inside out. I am your God. I have saved you. And the great thing you think about it, darkness runs from the illuminating power of light every single time. Light is always greater than darkness. If you were in a dark room, you kick on a flashlight, you open a door, what happens? Right? Everything starts to light up. It's not the other way around. Everything starts to light up. But men love darkness rather than light. And the problem in a nutshell is this. Mankind has fallen in love with its sickness, which is sin. Choosing to love slavery instead of genuine freedom that comes from a relationship with Jesus. It's a choice. People have chose to live in the slavery of bondage and the slavery of sin. But we can't use that word because it's, uh, it might offend you if I mention the word slavery. I'm sorry, if it does, to a degree. Right? If it moves you to the point of knowing Jesus Christ, I'm not sorry at all. That's the problem. The gospel is supposed to offend us because it offends sin. And if sin is in our body, it has to be offended in order for us to turn away from it. That's the greatness of light. It disrupts that sinful relationship. But darkness provides excuses, illegitimate justifications, purposeful ignorance, prideful opinions of ourselves. That's what darkness does. And instead of running away from it, people, to choose, people choose to run deeper into the darkness of the cave instead of running to the salvation of the light. It's crazy when you think about it. It is crazy. I don't know if, you ever, if anybody has ever taken a wandering uh, uh, journey through a, a long, dark cave that just gets narrower and narrower and narrower until it starts pressing in on all sides of you, and then you start to feel hopeless not knowing if you're ever going to get out. That's what darkness does. It slowly entraps you until the point where you are stuck. And all you have to do is turn around. And that's where Jesus is. That's the greatness of Jesus. And this morning I want to, I want to give you two psychological weapons of darkness that are currently active in destroying our nation. I want you to be aware of them, and I'm going to try to explain them in a, in a simplified version the best I possibly can, because we, we definitely do not have enough time to dive into all of this. But you need to understand that this is what is happening. This is what is happening, and the first, the first uh, psychological weapon is, is called critical theory. I don't know, most of you are probably not aware of what I'm about to give you. Some of you may be. These terms are, are referenced uh, all throughout our, our culture right now, and very little people understand what it actually is. Critical theory. This is it in a nutshell. The goal is for human emancipation from circumstances of domination and oppression. Any viewpoint of oppression, I will tell you, whether it is right or whether it is wrong. Right, is to free those who are oppressed. It is, li it is largely tied into social movements, which is predominantly seen today through modern feminism, sexual orientation, and critical race theory, or in other words, Black Lives Matter. The actual organization. Okay. And we're going to get into that in just in some more detail in just a little bit, but... Here's what the design is to do. Critical theory is used to create division. 
to promote disunity, to separate people, to remove what they don't like. Now notice I didn't say what may be true. It's what they don't like, and then replace it with a false idea of truth and tolerance. This started back in the 1800s and continues to gain ground where we sit today. I'm going to read you an example of this. It's an important example because it's only three hours away from here, give or take. A little over three hours in a small town of St. Anthony, Minnesota. I know some of you have probably heard this and read this and, or watched it. Several, uh, several residents received a complaint letter in regards to their Christmas lights. That's right, Christmas lights are now under attack. Now, mind you, the lady who posted this, let me paint this picture of her house. Christmas light string across the gutter and one circle wreath on the front of the house. When I first thought of this, I was thinking Griswolds, right? It's lit up all over the place. You can't see, causing all sorts of things. No, it is the simplest of decorations that you will ever find. But here is what this letter says. I want to read this to you. I couldn't help but notice your Christmas light display. Now think of this critical theory as I read this to you. Looking to make anything to be about oppression. I couldn't help but notice your Christmas light display. During these unprecedented times, <laughs> let's just stop using that word. Let's just say that God's returning soon. Right? During these unprecedented times, we have all experienced challenges which casual words just don't describe what we're feeling. Here's where it gets good. The idea of twinkling, colorful lights are a reminder of divisions that continue to run through our society. A reminder of systemic biases against our neighbors who don't celebrate Christmas or who can't afford to put up lights of their own. Christmas lights have stopped being lights and have now become any social or racial oppression against you and I. That's called trying to remove God from everything. Everything. It's it better. We must do the work of educating ourselves about the harmful impact an outward-facing display like yours can have. It continues to get better. I challenge you to respect the dignity of all people while striving to learn from differences, ideas, and opinions of our neighbors. We must come together collectively and challenge these institutional inequities. St. Anthony is a community welcoming of all people, and we must demand better for ourselves. The ironic thing is critical theory in this laced with it is just completely the opposite of what it says. In trying to express equality and justice, it is condemning those who have any different viewpoint. It is hypocritical in all of its entirety. This is what is increasing in our world today. It's what's happening. It's also called tyrannical socialism. And it's what our weak social movement politicians are promoting. And you need to be aware of it, because this is what's happening at Christmas time. By the way, it's also what the Antichrist uses to deceive everybody. That control people, as it's written in Daniel and Revelation. It's been around for a long time. right? It's been around. There's a second thing that I want to point out to you that goes along with this directly, and it's cultural Marxism. I don't know if you've heard the term. I'm going to give it to you. Cultural Marxism. It is not the same as classic Marxism. You need to understand that right off the bat. Classic Marxism was an economic system designed to get you out of a, a democratic capitalist type of idea. But the idea was that economic system exploited the masses of people. But people couldn't figure out, or those who believed in it couldn't figure out why capitalism continued to, to carry on. So here we have cultural Marxism, and it comes from two main players. And again, late 1800s into the early 1900s, this was established and is now 
while it's not now gaining ground, it was heavily promoted in our previous president, President Obama. It was founded, uh, or, or pretty much founded by Antonio, or two, two main players, uh, Antonio Gramsci. He's an Italian Marxist at the time. This is 1891. He was born. He died around 1937. He talks that the problem is the cultural hegemony. Yeah, I'm giving you some words. <laughs> That's why I wrote stuff down. So you know what? I had to look it up to figure out how to spell these things, by the way. So don't feel like you're out of place there. But here's what that means. He defined what cultural hegemony actually means. It's the domination or rule maintained through ideological or cultural means. It is usually achieved through social institutions, which allows those in power to strongly influence the values, norms, ideas, expectations, worldview, and behavior of the rest of society. Does this look familiar to you? Well, I'll give you some more detail that goes with this. This is how the society is looked at through the lens of in every social movement right now, through critical theory, coming through cultural Marxism, is, is looked at through the lens of these six things. You're white, you're male, you're heterosexual, you're cisgendered, which means that you actually identify with your birth sex. You're able-bodied, native-born Americans. If you are not that, you are considered a minority. It also means if you're not that, you're a victim of the cultural hegemony established by those individuals and therefore you are oppressed and need things to be changed. And if you're not that, you're automatically at war with it. And if you are that, it means you are a privileged individual. Okay? This is what's being taught everywhere. Everywhere. See, this, this gentleman, Gramsci, developed cultural hegemony to explain why classic Marxism didn't work. It didn't include the culture. It didn't include the culture. So the revolution that needs to come is one that changes the cultural hegemony. And it overturns it by two simple things. You control judges, professors, pastors, and politicians to educate and mobilize the masses against the hegemony. This is what we see right now, ladies and gentlemen. This is the fight. You control, in his essence, you control those who wear the ropes, who have the power to speak, to make decisions. And then the second thing is this. You use the educational system, the political system, and the judicial system to overturn any rulings that have already been made, any established uh, uh, cultural aspects that have already been made. This is how you gain power. One person by one person putting in into these, these positions of power. By the way, if you haven't been watching what our potential soon-to-be president is doing within his cabinet, this is exactly what he is doing. People put others in place to promise to advocate for them. Right? This is how supposedly privileged white individuals can advocate for minority races, because I promise that I will advocate on your behalf. Great, we love you. Go ahead, do it. We'll never point a finger at you. It's the political system. Right? That's what we have. This is how cultural Marxism works. But there's a second player. It's the Frankfurt School. It's a collection of scholars known for developing critical theory. And this is what they realized. Now, remind you, this is in the 20s, 30s, 40s, that is coming out, 1900s. So TV was not around, it was radio, newspapers, that sort of thing. You use the mass media to influence the public. You don't need to interact with people as much when you can give info through newspapers, radio, and now we do it relentlessly through the TV. You use these tools to change the, the hegemonic power, and this is what you do. You reduce everything to discussions of race, class, gender, and sex. Is that not all we talk about now? It is not God. It is not morals. It is, I am oppressed because I am something different, or I want to be something different. And mind you, I listed both gender and sex, right? 
Sex is the biology. That's what you were born. Male, female. Gender is what you want to claim to be. Right? So that is what is there. When you read these words in Scripture, men love darkness rather than light. It should come alive for you right now. This is what you are fighting against. This is the type of darkness the enemy is using to break down the love of God, the power of the light. And the power of sin is strong, it's deceptive, and it's extremely, extremely active. Therefore, you and I as Christians must be active in the world as well. If we look at, at verse 20 in John chapter 3, it says, For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deed should be exposed. That's kind of simple when you, when, you, when you read it. Nobody wants their, their sin exposed. They want it justified. That's darkness. Just tell me what I'm doing is okay. That way I can continue to live in the pleasure that I feel. Not change into the righteousness of God because it's better and greater and the promises are, are, are far, are far uh, more eternal. But we get to the greatness of, of Jesus in 21. He who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. He who speaks the truth of God. He who lives the truth of God loves the light, loves Jesus Christ. You can't, you can't stop it. This is why the greatness of God is seen all throughout the world. And by the way, people are coming to know Jesus all around the world. Right? You don't hear about it in the masses but it's happening because people are questioning how good the darkness is for them. This is our job, is to live, to speak the truth, the greatness of Jesus Christ. And right now, it's Christmas time. Why do we celebrate Christmas? Do not be afraid to tell people why you celebrate Christmas. This is my Savior. By the way, he's your Savior too. This is why we celebrate Christmas. In 1 John 5-7, through 7, It says very clearly, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I find that really encouraging. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. That is apostasy, false teaching. We love Jesus Christ, but you do everything possible against what the Bible has to say. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light... We have fellowship with one another. And here's the great, the great closing statement, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that beautiful? Just think about this. As you try to put yourselves in the shoes of Nicodemus as, as Jesus is subtly laying out all of these clues before him in a simple conversation. I am your Savior. You can live if you just believe in me. So this is what I want to tell you this, this morning. We celebrate Christmas, not because it was established by white European dudes of privilege. Okay? We celebrate Christmas because we love the light of the world and we believe in the promises that God has already given us. We celebrate Christmas because we had the promise delivered to us in a manger where nobody wanted him, and yet he came to save the world. He went to the cross where his own people didn't want him, and yet he died while we were enemies to be the savior of the world. And when he comes back, he's going to take his children to live with him forever. The hope that cannot run out. We Love Jesus. And don't be ashamed to say it, wherever you may are. Now, don't smack people around with it either, you know, but that's right. <laughs> at the same time, you know what I'm talking about, but it's Christmas. You're in the store. People are asking, so what's going on? Ah, we're just going to go celebrate Jesus. Okay, they'll probably run away from you, but it's fine. It's fine. You can tell them the gift, you know. Say, listen, you don't, Jesus' gift isn't in the mail. It's right here for you now. You can have fun with people. 
It's good. If they want to converse with you, just tell them the truth. We celebrate Christmas because we love Jesus. And no matter what the world is going to tell us, we're going to celebrate our King and our Savior. That is God. That's God. So much he loves us. Let's pray together. Father, it is a joy to pray with fellow believers. Lord, undoubtedly there is darkness in the world, but I take great courage knowing that your word clearly states Jesus is greater than Satan. That the light of the cross, the light of the gospel, the salvation found in the finished work of the cross will eradicate any darkness, any time, all the time. Lord, I want to thank you for that cleansing blood of Jesus that as we stand in the courtroom condemned says we are no longer judged by our sin. We are covered in the pure blood of righteousness. Lord, as, as we leave here in just a couple days, we're going to celebrate your birth. Father, may we remember this every single day. We should not only celebrate your birth, but your life that you give, as you are the light of the world. Oh, God, you are so good. So good. I want to thank you that you have claimed, and, have, and it is true that you have stated you love your children. You love your creation. And because of that, we can boldly and confidently say, we love you. Thank you for being our Heavenly Father and providing a way to remove the separation, for tearing the veil, and adopting us as children into the greatest family that ever will be yours. Father, thank you this morning. And all God's people said, Amen. We're going to close with a song today. If you would kindly stand with us, if you are able to do so. If you just want to listen, by all means, go ahead and just listen. Or if you want to sing out, let it flow.
Jesus through kids, adults, songs, skits. The glory of God radiates everywhere, through everything. I'd like to again invite you, we're going to have a Christmas Eve service. If you're around, we'd love to see you. If not, we'd like to wish you a Merry Christmas. May the day be blessed by the hand of God as you worship the King of Kings. Heavenly Father, as everyone leaves here, just pray your hand of blessing as they lift up your name above all other names. And they claim the greatest gift that has ever been given to Jesus Christ. Thank you for your son today. Father, we just ask this all in the name of our beloved Savior and King. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful day.